Hello and welcome back to the Danfoss Drive School. Today we are going to look into permanent magnet motors or that is how to tune the drive to run permanent magnet motors. The four episodes will have the following subjects. The first one will look into how actually a permanent magnet motor work, the theory behind it, how closed loop versus the open loop work, sensorless closed loop, the principles behind it, and efficiency of these motors. In episode two, we go more into efficiency. And also when to use a permanent magnet motor and when you should use a induction motor. Selecting the right type of permanent magnet motors. And what about encoders? Episode three, then we take a look into reluctance motor and especially the Danfoss Editon motor, which is a permanent magnet assisted reluctance synchronous motor. Wow, that is a long and difficult word, but actually in practical life it's not that much different from a PM motor when it comes to the tuning. Episode 4, we go to a shipyard, to a site, and we take a look at identification runs in practical life. We look at encoder signal quality, how this affects the closed loop tuning, and also take a look at setting up sensorless closed loop. How does the permanent magnet motor actually work? Here we have a drive shaft with a process, here a ship propeller. On the drive shaft we have put a permanent magnet made of a material called neodymium which is a very strong magnetic rear metal. Here we have the North Pole and the South Pole of the magnet. Then we put a piece of iron, we call it the stator. And around this iron we put an electrical winding and this is connected to a frequency converter, a drive. In this case, NXP drive. We know from the physics that when a current goes through an electrical wire, then there will be a magnetic field around the wire. This magnetic field will push the iron atoms into pointing into one direction. So here we can, with the electrical current, force all the south poles to point in one direction. So this piece of iron becomes like a magnet, where we can control the south pole in this case, and we can also then, by turning the direction of the current, then we can turn this pole into becoming a north pole. We know that different polarity on the magnetics will attract each other. So these two ones, they will attract. And we now get a small rotation. So this one will move up to here. To get the full 360 degree rotation, of course, we then put many stator poles and they shift in pulling the rotor around. This is a miniature permanent magnet motor. On the rotor we have installed permanent magnets. Normally the stator winding will create the magnetic field pulling in the rotor magnets. To simulate this, I have here a permanent magnet, which makes a field. And here we see that by moving and rotating the state of field, I can have a rotation on the machine shaft. Important here is to see that the state of field and the magnetic field from the rotor always need to be in synchronization. This is why it's called a synchronous machine. Also, the angle between these two, we see that they like to sit straight overhead each other. This is called the polar angle. If this angle gets too big, we see that they don't interact with each other anymore. This is called a motor stall. And this is why the polar angle can only be up to a certain value. If it gets too big, the motor stalls. We are now going to look into the motor back EMF voltage. All permanent magnet motors, they are able to produce a voltage which is more or less linear with the speed you pull the rotor. If you're using 
the motor as a windmill. Let's say we have a windmill here on the rotor. So it spins around and every time the magnet passing the state of winding, there will be induced a voltage in the electrical circuit. So the driver here will see a voltage which is more or less linear to the RPM. This is called the back EMF voltage. And every permanent magnet motor will have a specific back EMF voltage as function of its RPM or Hertz, which is exactly the same. Okay, this was the motor used as a windmill. I want to use it as a ship propeller propulsion plant. So my frequency converter want to pull the motor and control the motor. What then about the back EMF? It means that if I want to spin the ship propeller, let's say at 500 RPM, 500 RPM, it means that the motor itself produces some voltage. So for me to be able to control the motor with the drive, I need to push the current here. So my drive need to have a voltage output, which is higher than the back EMF. It means that to control this motor as a propul ship propulsion plant, my frequency converter need to sit above the back EMF voltage at any time. The green curve here is what the motor vendor calls the motor nominal. This is the recommended voltage from the frequency converter to control the motor. The voltage difference between the output from the drive and the motor back EMF, this is what will drive the current. And this is what the motor vendor tells us to push voltage to the motor to get the nominal performance of the motor. So when you look at the data plate on the motor, you will probably find these numbers. The difference between the motor nominal voltage and the back EMF voltage is usually in the range 6 to 7%. So if you have to estimate this in the field, then 6-7% is a good estimate. Some motor vendors, they just give the back EMF voltage on the data sheet and then it can be a little bit tricky to estimate what a motor nominal voltage would be. Let's put our motor under load. We pitch the ship propeller and we want the full forward and rotate as fast as possible. So what happens is that the frequency converter will rotate the stator magnet field. Now, the propeller is hard to drive, it's heavy. So the magnets, the rotor, will start lagging behind. This is the pole angle. Here we see that the magnets, they are not straight over the magnet field from the stator and there is a danger that you actually are losing it. Remember what happened with the small miniature motor? When I pull this too far, it just stalled. So this must not happen. We must make sure that this polar angle are kept within its physical limits. The way it's done in uh, a frequency converter is with a closed loop control. We have a computer to control this. We put a sensor on the shaft so that we always can see how the rotor is positioned in reference to the stator magnet field. So this polar angle is known to the frequency converter. What happens is that if this angle gets a little bit too big and there is a danger that you start losing uh, the motor. There is a danger for stalling. The frequency converter will increase the voltage to the state of winding and there will be a higher reactive current in the state of winding which creates a higher physical force. So these two are moved closer to each other. So it's a kind of um, computerized control system that keeps this polar angle within its limits all the time. Uh, the motor vendor tells us that for a certain amount of torque, there should be a certain 
polar angle. This gets too big. What happens is that the frequency converter will increase the voltage, increase the current for the reactive current, which creates more physical force, and we get a smaller polar angle. The magnets are simply pulled towards the stator magnet field. In this way, if you have small load on the shaft, let's say the shape propeller is flat pitched, well, then there is no need for excessive current going into the stator winding, so the reactive current will be pretty low. The torque produced don't need to be excessive. In this way, we keep the current to the motor down to an absolutely minimum. Physically, what happens is that the frequency converter will lift and lower the voltage out of the drive to sit above the back EMF voltage just enough, just optimal for what's needed to drive this process. What about running the permanent magnet motor in open loop? We are running then without the sensor, without the encoder, and resolver signal. Then the drive does not know for sure what the pole angle is. So the way to do it in open loop is that we create a excessive reactive current. So the force between the state of field and the magnet is quite high. The reactive current can then be all the way up to its maximum torque. And that is regardless what the physical process actually need on the shape propeller. The shape propeller could be in flat pitch, but we still need the full torque just to ensure that the pole angle is within the limits. The drive then runs according to a UF curve, that is the voltage as function of the speed. Just gives a fixed, quite high voltage to ensure that we have the high reactive current to create the maximum torque. The problem with this is efficiency. Because now we are running excessive current through our stator windings. So our copper losses and iron losses will be excessive high. So this is not a very efficient way of running a permanent magnet motor. It is more for commissioning and debugging. And for normal running, this will have an efficiency which is lower than most motors. Tweaking the UF curve can be done manually or you can do an identification run without rotation. Then the drive will measure what is the real resistance in your motor cables and the stator windings and it will come up with a curve, especially in the low speed area, in the zero speed area. This is quite critical because at zero speed the impedance in the motor is only the resistance in the circuit. So, the voltage to create even a quite high uh, current, it's just some few volts, 5 volts, 10 volts, something like that. So how the UF curve looks here in the low speed area is quite critical and is easiest to do in the identification run without rotation. What about sensorless closed loop motor control? Sensorless closed loop is based on a synthetic encoder in the drive software. We sense on the motor current and the motor voltage, especially the curve form coming back from the static door winding, and create a synthetic encoder which is used in the motor closed loop control. The drive acts almost like it was running on a hardware encoder. The problem with this is zero speed, because at zero speed there is not a curve form voltage coming from the state of windings. So at zero speed and very low speeds, this doesn't work very well. And then we have to swap over to another motor control mode, which is IF control. We're just running a fixed current to the state of winding and we start rotating with a over magnetized motor. And when we get it up to speed and we get a sensible curve shape back to the synthetic encoder, then we take over with the synthetic sensorless closed loop. Then one thing about overspeeding a permanent magnet motor. Let's say you have a winch and you have a failure in the brake system so that the load falls down and your winch is spinning free. 
Actually, there will be a voltage produced by the permanent magnet motor, which can be so high that the frequency converter cannot sustain this voltage. Some traumatic failure in case you are overspeeding uh, the permanent magnet motor. Now that we have learned how the permanent magnet motor actually works, we are going to look more closely into efficiency and how these motors actually are built. We will do that in the next episode, so roll over to the next episode and we'll take a look at that.